Guys, if you're serious about building muscle and reducing body fat and generally just recomping to create your ideal physique, you should seriously consider taking a turkesterone supplement. Turkesterone is one of the most exciting new ingredients to hit the supplement industry in years. And courtesy of Creation Supplements, we have an exclusive offer for those of you listeners of the Fitness Times Business Podcast who are interested in adding turkesterone to your supplement stack. Creation Turka Pure, pure turkesterone at 30% off, a huge 30% off when you use the code FXB upon checkout at massivejoes.com, exclusive for Fitness Times Business Podcast listeners. Guys, head to massivejoes.com, throw a tub of Creation Supplements Turka Pure in your cart, pop the code FXB on checkout, and you'll save yourself 30%. Let's get down to business. Thanks for coming out tonight. I wrote me a manual, a step-by-step booklet for you to get. Oh, I make money moves. You can't see me, my time is now. What up, what up, what up, guys? Welcome back to the Fitness Times Business Podcast, the show created to provide you with the practical and strategic advice to help you level up in fitness, business, your career, your relationships, and your life. My name is Joseph Metzel. I am your host, and I have a very special guest for this episode of the podcast. Welcome, Emma Bowman. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I'm so excited for this chat. I, um, I, 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 it's an absolute honor to have you on the podcast, uh, especially because this is your first ever podcast, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah so we're throwing you in the deep end. <laughs> you sure are. I, yeah. I said uh, we were just preparing for, the, um, for this uh, podcast off camera and I said, Emma, Knowing that this is your first podcast and knowing that you are naturally introvert, I won't tell you how many people listen to this podcast. <laughs> so don't, we'll, don't after. <laughs> we'll save that for, uh, for, for after the show. But um, it's an absolute honor to have you. I'm super excited about this chat. Uh, there are so many uh, unique insights that you have to offer um, through your life experience. Uh, and I want to start by giving you a little introduction to the listeners and the viewers that uh, this may be their actual introduction to you. They've never heard of you before. This is, they don't know who you are. Uh, but to a lot of listeners and viewers, they will know who you are and they may know what they see on different social media. Um, but I want to give you a little bit of an elevator pitch and then I want you to tell your origin story. So um, for those of you who are meeting Emma for the first time, Emma is a uh, posing coach, very reputable posing coach, also an online coach. Uh, Emma is a wife, almost married 20 years, if I'm not mistaken, coming up to 20 years, uh, a mother of three children, boy and two girls. How old are your children? 12, 10 and 8. Okay. So three children uh, and South Australia's first ever IFBB Bikini Pro. And of course, an MJ, TMJ apparel sponsored athlete. Uh, you've got a whole lot going on, Emma. <laughs> there's, really there's, a, there's a lot going on here. Um, but let's start, let's start with your, your origin story. Tell us a little bit about Emma Bowman. All right. So um, I guess going way back um, when I was at school, um, probably 15 or 16 years of age, I tried a lot of different sports and I failed miserably at anything to do with bull sports. Um, I was a horse rider and a dancer um, and I, I wanted to be an actress. Oh, wow. um, yeah. Um, so I, my sister was into fitness and I always tried to, I tried triathlons and I tried netball um, and nothing really gelled with me. I wanted to keep fit, but it was for the wrong reasons back then. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately from around the age of uh, 15, 16, I developed an eating disorder um, and that was bulimia and it was quite serious. Um, and it was, you know, something I kept to myself. No one knew. My family probably know now if they're listening to this. Um, but, you know, I've been open about it before um, because I think it can help people realise that there's a way out. Um, so I had that eating disorder for a good 17 years um, and I was involved in the gym. I'd go to the gym but I would overtrain. Um, I wanted to be skinny <laughs> and uh, back in my day it was all about magazines and it was about the waif look um, <clears throat> and all the supermodels. Um, and I would just strive to look like that. Um, with my body, it was never going to happen. Uh, so I did some horrid things to myself, um, the way that I treated myself for all that time. And yeah, I was in the gym on the outside. I looked fit and semi-healthy. 
Um, but what I did behind the scenes wasn't great. Um, so I was in the gym. I would, like I said, overtraining. I do back to back cardio classes and never touched a weight. Um, and it wasn't until I saw an amazing woman come into the gym and she was ripped. <laughs> she was, she was so shredded. Um, and she was older. She would have been probably 50 years of age. And she started doing chin ups right in front of me. I think I was, you know, struggling away on the bike or something. Um, and I very, very shy back then. Um, but I thought I have to know what this lady's done to look like that. It was extraordinary. Um, so I took up, you know, plucked up the courage to go speak to her. And she said, oh, you need to lift weights. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I lift weights in body pump. And she's like, no. And she actually used the words of you have to lift like a man. And back then that's all there was in the weight section. It was just guys. That was why I wouldn't go. I was. I found it very intimidating. Yeah. Um, and just in terms of timing as well, just to put some timing around, this is, this is like 25 years ago now, right? So this is not, you know, five years ago. This is fitness back in the, this is late 90s. Yeah, I grew up in the 80s, 90s. Yeah, um, yeah. So, so a lot different to how it looks now. Like you go so into different. a gym now and it's like there's more girls in the weights room than there is guys. Thank God. Back then, yeah, right? Back then it was like guys would be lifting the weights and girls would be in either the cardio room or the aerobics room yeah. and doing the, the classes and all that sort of stuff. It was a lot different back then just to provide some context to how it is now, right? A hundred percent, yeah. Um, women didn't go in the men's area. Mm. Like it was um, – like that's that was – extremely intimidating you would go to the gym to lose weight that's where you would go you would get there you go there to get skinny you know they used to have um classes like that that you know they would promote that kind of thing um back in the days of you know popping diet pills and um you know zero calorie diets and crazy stuff like that it wasn't about retaining muscle no not at all um and certainly wasn't really no one cared about getting strong um but yet the girls wanting to look toned. <laughs> Little did they know that it was about, you know, you've got to weight train to look toned. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I asked the lady and she told me, you got to lift like a guy. And she said, you need to get your protein um, lifted. I'm like, protein? Like, what do you mean? And she said, you need to eat protein like every meal. Um, so that changed my concept of how I need to fuel my body for once rather than starve it and then get rid of it or if I did purge and binge and all of that crazy stuff I used to do. Um so, yeah, it really flipped a switch for me mm. and I then just started researching like crazy. I've got a very addictive personality, so it became my thing. I just researched, researched, and I fell in love with it. Um, and from that point, I, I changed my training style probably the next day, <laughs> um, changed my nutrition. It really was almost overnight for me. Um, and the changes I saw in my body happened quite fast. Um, I could always feel that I had, you know, abs there, but I could never see them. And as soon as I started lifting well and, and eating well, suddenly I looked like fit and I looked strong and I looked healthy. Um, so that was the change for me from going being a cardio bunny into weightlifting. Yeah, that was the introduction. It was, yeah. And then you um, – you I guess your kind of career starts developing then as well, right? In the early 2000s, 2001, I think it was, you joined the police force yes. or the police academy, I should say, on, on route to becoming a police officer um, at 20, 21 years old. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, when I was, you know, leaving, when I left school, um, I tried out for NIDA, which is an um, acting school, and I didn't get in, broke my heart. Um, and so suddenly I kind of went, well, I need a secure job, uh, something that pays well. And um, I thought, well, well it's better than government. <laughs> um, so I got into the police force and did the academy um, and put the uniform on and did the thing. And I did that for a good, um, oh, good 12 years. Um, and, yeah, I never really felt like it was me. It was something, you know, you put your uniform on and you have to kind of, we were told to act a certain way, yeah. be a certain person, mm -hmm. react a certain way, um, no emotion. And that is just not me, uh, but I would play the role. Um, and so in that, yeah, I found it, it never sat well with me. Um, so, yeah, and then I, um, that's when, around that time when I, um, I met my husband and um, then we 
uh, got married. <laughs> um, and yeah, that's the next chapter, I guess. Yeah. And the next chapter um, is a really interesting one because you uh, get diagnosed with skin cancer shortly after getting married. Yeah, so it was the same year. I um I was uh, I used solariums a lot, yep. and again back in the day we used to be queen operated, um and we would just stay in there as long as we could, um to get a tan. And they used to be legal as well. Yeah, you, know, yeah, I was you can't use solariums anymore because of this. Yes. Uh, yeah, but back then, yeah. Crazy. Um, and you know, you'd put the oils on and you would bubble underneath and you'd be like, yeah, I'm going to get tan from this. <laughs> um, and you know, again, it's one of those things of you knew the risks, but yeah. you just brushed it away because you thought it won't happen to me. Yeah. I'll um, be the exception. Yeah. Um, until it's, it is you. Um, and yeah, I got diagnosed with melanoma in my arm. Um, got the phone call from the doctor and it scared the living daylights out of me. Um, and thankfully they got it early. Uh, it was, you know, it was a decent level, but they got it all out. Um, got a decent scar on my arm from it. Um, but it definitely made me, made me reali- um, reevaluate life a little bit about what's important and how life can be quite short. Um, and so I knew I wanted kids and, um, so we got to it pretty quick after that. Yeah, no doubt. And you're in your mid twenties here, right? Um, I was, yeah, mid twenties. Yeah. Mid twenties, married, skin cancer, decide that, you know what, we, we, your husband and yourself, we want to have a family. Let's try and have a family. And uh, I guess you had these plans for how that was going to work and then what happens? Yeah, the whole white picket fence thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, ticking all the boxes. But unfortunately, it didn't work that way for us. Um, so, you know, I, I still hadn't um, found the gym for weightlifting at this stage. I was still – I still had the eating disorder. I was still going to the cardio and all of that. That uh, The weightlifting was much later on. Um but yeah, we, we tried for children and we got pregnant and a bit naive. We shared it to the world and to the family. And unfortunately we lost that one. Um, and from that point on started a really hard time in our lives, um, where we had, uh, we had to eventually use IVF. Um, and we suffered numerous losses, many operations, every medication under the sun, uh, and we just kept getting pregnant and losing. Um, it was a very, very hard time. Um, and <laughs> I'm getting emotional about it. Um, yeah, and, you know, that was the time that I decided to have to get healthy. Um, so I dropped the eating disorder, again, pretty much overnight um, to try and focus on my health. Um, you know, physically I, I changed. I looked completely different with all the, the you know, the steroids they put through you and the hormones they put through you. And I would store my medication in the fridge at work and my workmates didn't know. We didn't tell anyone. Um, And we were eventually told that we couldn't have children. Uh, We looked up adoption and all sorts of things, surrogacy. I had some amazing friends offer. Uh, So we were quite desperate. Um, And eventually, yeah, we were told that we couldn't have kids and I went, hell no. (laughs) <laughs> Screw that. Like It know. must have been incredibly difficult though. It was. That, that going through that, you know, especially on the back of the melanoma and then going, no, 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 like I'm reevaluating what's important in my life here. This is what we want to do. We want to start a family. This is how our life is going to look. And then, you know, coming up against those sorts of opinions, right, and and everything that kind of goes into that. It must have been incredibly difficult. Yeah, it certainly was. Um, and, you know, we just dealt with it between us and uh, – I think being in the police force helped with this because I uh, I became very black and white about it. I had to remove, for me, it's different for everyone, I had to remove emotion yeah. from the whole process. Uh, I had to just do the thing, um, go for the injections and, and just follow the process of getting this done so I could have a baby. Um, so, you know, they would ring us up and tell us each time that we were we were pregnant and it was horrible <laughs> because they would tell us at six weeks and then knowing that you would probably lose it. Um, so it robbed us from uh, the happy side of, of falling pregnant and all of that. But I'm forever thankful to science and to the process because eventually uh, four years later, a lot of money later and a lot of pain and tears, uh, we fell pregnant with our first. Um, and that's Lockie and he's 12 years old now and he's amazing. <laughs> um, and 
yeah, from there we um, we stored the eggs and um, we had ivy two years later yep. and then two years later from that we had violet. Incredible. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> yes. And I can, I can tell by the smile on your face that, you know, uh, n- no doubt I have absolutely no appreciation for how difficult that period must have been for you, but you gleaming from ear to ear, right? So 100% worth it. 100% worth it and they are my everything. <laughs> Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. definitely worth it. So, um, you know, if people lose hope so easily in, in IVF and I, we just consider ourselves extremely lucky, uh, you know, every, every day. I'm, I'm forever thankful that I've got them in my life. Absolutely. Yeah. Next chapter. After the uh, you have your three children and uh, then uh, really the next chapter is you start to really look into fitness from a competitive perspective. Yeah. Yep. So that was when I met that woman in the, in the gym. Yep. Um, so, you know, to lose the body weight from, from pregnancy weight and all of that, that I went through, I did my hit, did my hit stuff and did my um, bloody horrific bloody exercises to try and drop it. And eventually I actually did drop it just by doing a lot of cardio and a lot of that stuff. It wasn't fitness. It wasn't strength based. Um, and then the lady walked in the gym and that's when I kind of shifted my mentality around everything. Um, nutrition and training styles completely changed up. Um, and yeah, I, six months later, I, uh, when my littlest was, I think she was about 16 months old. Um, I flew to Melbourne and did my first comp. In 2016. Yeah. Around about. Around yeah, about. If I've got my dates, if I've got my years correct, 2016. Why did you travel to Melbourne to do your first comp? <laughs> <laughs> just, just out of interest? Um, because I didn't want to compete in front of my hometown. I was embarrassed. Um, and, you know, I think it's a, a bit of a misconception that a lot of athletes are, you know, full of themselves and, um, you know, extroverted and all of that. And I'm not like that at all. And uh, so to compete in my hometown in front of my family and my friends, that kind of scared me a lot. Uh, so I thought, well, I'm going to fly to Melbourne and see how I go, um, get the nerves out of the way. I was very nervous, um, shaking on stage and all sorts and get that out of the way and then come back for the SA show. Yep. And so you come back to SA, do your first show, didn't win, yeah, I won in Melbourne um, and then I came back to SA and I didn't win yeah. and I didn't like that. <laughs> um, and it's funny because I never thought of myself as a competitive person, um, but it was more so for me, I knew that I could do more um, and bring better. So uh, I gave myself another year and I just had this fire inside of me that just went, I'm going to blow them away when I come back and they're not even going to recognize me. And then 2017 rolls along and you do exactly that. I did. Right. And this is with uh, the federation you were competing with at the time was IMBA slash ICN as we now know it. Um, You turn pro in ICN, you go and do the pro shows in Thailand as a pro and pretty much win everything. Yeah. Yeah. I did uh, the state show and I won, yeah, fitness pro card and then I went over and uh, tried for my sport pro card and won that too. Um, And yeah, um, then over two years traveling to Thailand for the pro show mm-hmm. over there and, yeah, um, winning the world show twice. And it's an interesting time in your life here once again uh, because this is really another fork in the road for you, right? Because now you're competing, you're doing well as not just a competitor but as a, a pro in this particular federation. And you decide at the time to kind of go, you know what, I want to take a little bit of a break from my career as a, as a, as a police officer. And I guess you'd, you'd identified, um, really kind of a business opportunity, right? As a posing coach, as a nutritionist, as an online coach, and you wanted to kind of scratch that itch a little bit. So you go and put your, I guess you call it a career break with the police force, five year career break. And you're like, I want to go and explore what I can do from a business perspective in the fitness industry. And talk to me a little bit about how that plays out. Yeah. So, um, there was a lot of interest obviously when I competed, um, within my workplace, you know, eating all the food that I was eating and, um, and then standing on stage, like a lot of them hadn't seen it before, but they could see my results. Um, so I ended up, you know, getting asked by a lot of police officers to build meal plans for them, to help them, to give them training advice. And I was just, you know, giving a lot of free advice out there. I loved it. I was so passionate about it and still am. Um, 
And I thought, if I am, I, I've never felt passion like this in my life, like for a job. Yeah. And I still don't class it as a job. Um, I truly just love what I do and I don't see it as work. Um, and to, yeah, I guess realize I was, you know, people are interested in this and wanting to learn and wanting to better themselves. Um, and luckily with SAPOL, they allow us to have a career break. Mm. So I applied for a two year career break to begin with. Um, and took that and started officially posing people in gyms. Yeah. Uh, then I eventually found myself a studio. Unoffi- unofficially, unofficially posing people yeah. in gyms. Thanks, good yeah. luck, <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, and, um, you know, then getting coaching girl, like coaching girls to stage. And then I realised when I started coaching girls to stage that it was just like having me up there, the passion I felt for, for bringing another person's dreams you know, um, into play onto stage, just lit my fire again as much as it did for the competing for myself. Um, so, yeah, I just kind of built the brand from there and um, it was originally called Fit Busy Body. <laughs> um, I remember. You remember, yeah, yeah. Uh, which was really hard to say and I'm very much a tongue twister. Um, and then eventually just kind of morphed that into just my name. <laughs> it was so much easier. Um, yeah, and so the posing side of things really built up. The coaching, bringing girls to stage through nutrition and training as well. Um, and it is to what it is today. And now I've uh, moved over to a different studio, which I've been at for a good uh, four or five years now. Um, yeah, and it is what it is today. And then you, um, so you do another uh, season of competing with the ICN as a pro um, in 2018. And I guess then at that point, you're kind of like, all right, you know, this is, I guess, the I've kind of reached my capacity here. Um, and you start looking for the next competitive challenge. And the IFBB piques your interest and bikini in the IFBB piques your interest. And so you start in 2019, um, you transition from ICN, kind of doing everything that you could possibly do as an ICN pro, back to an amateur in the IFBB as a bikini athlete. And how does that play out for you? Yeah, Um I, I've always obviously loved the look of the IFBB bikini girls. Um, yeah, and I just wanted a new challenge physically in the gym. Um, I looked good from the front, but I had no glutes. <laughs> um, and as we know with IFBB, that's, it's all about delts and glutes. So it was a, a real physical change that I had to make um, and invest in to bring a different look completely. Um, so, yeah, I just started to train like an IFBB pro <laughs> and had that mentality. And I remember a really good friend of mine at the time told me that I'd never be able to be in IFBB, uh, that I'd never be muscular enough. I'd never have that look. And that was perfect. I'm so thankful. I love being told what I can't do Yeah, this from is a bit else. of a recurring theme <laughs> It is you, a, right? bit like, a, yeah. a bit of a theme. <laughs> so I, uh, I kind of went, oh, well, I'll show you. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, competed in the state show in 2019 yep. and won that. Mm-hmm. Um, there was always a bit of a fear for me going into IFBB, such change. Um, and, you know, even people assuming that you had to, you know, use certain supplements or whatever it might be to be in the federation. Yep. Um, and I didn't know who was coming into the comp. I, I stick to myself when I'm competing. I block and mute everything. Mm-hmm. So I didn't have a clue who was standing on stage. I didn't even know on the day how many people I had up on the stage with me. I just got up there and did my thing um, and did all right. So I won. Uh, and then I went to the Arnold's. Over in Melbourne, Over in Melbourne. 2019, when we, it was, well, technically it was the last Arnold before um, the pandemic shut it down. 2019, you go and do the Masters at the Arnold and you come third yeah. at that point, right? And so then that, kind of continues to light this fire. Uh, 2020 rolls around. You start prepping for season A 2020. You're going to go and do the pro qualifier in New Zealand was the plan. And two weeks before the show, the world collapses. (laughs) And I know what that feels like personally. Um, COVID hits. uh, You've prepped. You've done a full prep. You're two weeks out. Uh, How did that feel? Yeah, it sucked. It really hurt. Um, I was looking good. I'd made so much change and I was so excited to compete. Um, I really thought, you know, everyone thinks you might, this might be the one, you know, this might be our time. And uh, yeah, two weeks out, every, the borders shut on me. Um, and, you know, I f- fell in a bit of a hole for two days, just two days. Um, had a cry. And because you invest so much in this, you know, 
emotionally and financially and socially, you know, everything gets affected, everything, when you comp prep and to not have a result on that <laughs> kind of sucked. Um, but then I just looked, took it as a learning curve and I was kind of, you know, took as many pics as I could and thought, okay, well, how can we build from that? Um, yeah, and so put plan in place again to compete the following year. In 2021. And I guess, you know, it wasn't all um, shit in 2020 because COVID did wonders for your business at that point in time. You know, both the posing and the coaching and your business really kind of really went to the next level um, during 2020. Then we get to 2021. Uh, you come back, do the state show, season A, you win again. So two times champion at this point. Uh, you go to the season A pro qualifier, which was in Brisbane, if my memory serves me right. I think I emceed that show you did. back back then. <laughs> uh, you win the Masters, you win your open class, you go into the pro pose down and you come up without a pro card. Yeah. Once again. Interesting in 2021 because this is now you have to make a little bit of a decision about your career right? Because it, it's coming towards the end of the initial two-year career break that turned into a five-year career break and say Paul comes back and they're knocking on the door and they're saying, Emma, are you going to come back or what's happening here? And you make the decision that, you know what, I'm, I'm actually going to close that door, my career door behind me and this is what I'm going to commit to um, with no safety net at that point, right? I want to talk a little bit about that decision, but I'll come back to that because I then want to get into 2022 last year back around once again and you decide, you know what, 2022, I'm going to throw everything that I possibly can at trying to get this IFBB pro card. You work with a coach for the first time. Um, You do the longest prep that you've ever done. Uh, Your intention at that point was always to travel to an international pro qualifier and compete, but you were in shape. So you're like, you know what, I'm going to do the SA show again win it for the third time, three times undefeated champion. You go to the pro qualifier once again in Brisbane for season B um, in 2022. You play second in your open category. So you actually don't even make it to the the pro pose down. Uh, And I remember being in a um, Uber with you on the back back on the way to your hotel after that and um and you were saying no i'm going to japan and i'm going to go and 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 see what i can do over there um and so uh, a week later two weeks later you go over to japan you win your class you win your pro card you go into the pro lineup you become south australia's first ever ifbb bikini pro you make your pro debut the same weekend Fantastic. Yeah, great result. How did that feel? <laughs> really good. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> I actually allowed myself to celebrate that one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was amazing. Um, it was, yeah, like I said, the longest prep I've ever done. Um, and I always believed that I'd always thrown everything into every prep. And I still believe that. I believe, you know, that I, I did that at the time. But last year it was, okay, what haven't I done? What is it? What haven't I done? So, okay, well, I haven't gone overseas. I haven't like allowed myself to get a coach. So yeah, I um, asked for some extra eyes on me, um, which, you know, I'm sure it's definitely paid off. You know, I um, went over, Japan was always going to be the goal, but I'm glad I did nationals because I got great feedback at nationals and um, I changed things up for Japan based on that. Um, And you've got to listen to the judges. You've got to listen to the feedback, um, which is what I did. And yeah, Japan liked it. Um, and did it right in the pre lineup, but yeah. Yeah, amazing. It's an incredible story. And there are some recurring themes here and, and a few things that I really want to take a deep dive into. Um, the first one is this keeps coming up time and time again where you have this attitude around, um, well, there's two elements to it. It's an attitude of never giving up right? First and foremost, whether it's got to do with being told that you can't have children and going, you know, I don't care what you say. I'm going to continue to do what needs to be done, commit to the process, and I will not give up. I don't care what what gets said about this. When it comes to the competing side of things, you know, the number of times that you just kept coming back, kept coming back, didn't get the result. Okay, I'll go again. I'm going to keep coming. And the number of people, like you mentioned, that said you'll never do well as an IFBB uh, bikini athlete. You just don't have the genetics for it or the physique for it or the stage presence for it or any of that sort of stuff. And you're like, no, 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 I'm, I'm, this is what I'm going to do. I'm not going to take no for an answer. What are your thoughts on 
using there's two types of energies right that people will generally use to fuel this attitude of never giving up on one side there's what i what people generally refer generally refer to as dark energy which is i'm going to do this to prove the to the people who said that i couldn't do it i'm going to prove them wrong and that's going to be my dark energy on the other side is bright energy or light energy which is no i don't really care about what other people say i can and can't do this is more about proving myself right from the way you tell your story you tend to swing towards the dark energy aspect of it a little bit more right is <laughs> like listen to my music in the gym <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i'm you know i'm not going to take no for an answer and it's almost like you feed off that dark energy a little bit is that would you say that that's true well, i think you hit the nail on yeah. the head there yeah. um yeah. you know when i train i use my emotion when i train uh-huh. You know, do not approach me when I train. I, yeah. I, I'm quite aggressive when I train. I, the music I listen to is nasty. Um, and, yeah, I, I definitely have that element where I'm like, yeah, it's, it's not all based off of, you know, telling that person, but it's more so knowing that, like, within me, I, I knew there was something in me that just would not give up. Mm-hmm. It's just this, all I can describe it, it's just like a fire inside of you. And if, if you know, it's just knowing that you can do better. You can show everyone. You can bring your best and get what you want. You just don't give up. Where do you think that comes from? I think, honestly, I reckon the IVF process probably was one of the big ones for that because it was such an emotional journey that is unparalleled. I mean, what you're dealing with, you're talking about human life that you're wanting. It's just, you can't, you can't, there's nothing that compares for me. Um, so that in itself built who I was. Um, and then, you know, even the policing background that I've got, you know, that, um, it was very structured and, you know, you just gotta, you've got to be adaptable to some degree. I say it's structured, but you've got to be adaptable because shit can change so fast and you have to react and change to that. Um, so I think it's that masculine side, I definitely have a, a high masculine side to me rather than feminine. Um, and so I pull from that. I definitely pull from a masculine side when I train with the concept around comp prep. Um, when I'm in the zone for comp prep, that's it's a full focus and it's a masculine energy that I pull from and I love it. Um, and then when I, when I finish out of the comp prep, then I've got to try and search for that feminine side, which is there as well. It's just a matter of um, pulling from the different energies to the specifically to the ladies that are listening at the moment, right? I really want to kind of drill down in here to the ladies that are listening and have come up against an obstacle of some sort, right? May perhaps it's, you know, IVF that they're going through. Perhaps it's a obstacle in their career progression. Perhaps it's an obstacle in their personal life with a relationship they're working through, whatever it is. And they're just at the point where it's like, you know what, I'm ready to wave the white flag. I'm ready to just kind of give up. How do you tap into what you refer to as that masculine energy or that dark energy? Or, you know, what what can you really provide as like – This is what you need to do to just keep going. I don't think there's any external source that you can get that from. It really does come from within you. So if you've got something in the back of your head that just won't let up, that's what you need to fuel. You need to believe in yourself. Um, Don't reach for other people to try and push you into that. Um, You can't... um, if, if you truly want something and it's just fighting away inside of you and it won't let up, won't let up, you've got to drill into that um, and laser focused. Do you think that there's value in in perhaps even using the energy that's associated with, look, I'm ready to give up, right? And kind of using whatever the obstacle is or using whatever the challenge is as a way of actually refining the skill of tapping into that dark energy? Because you mentioned like the IVF was kind of that that process, that four years of going through the emotions associating with that and just just committing to, no, 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 I'm actually going to use this as an opportunity to develop the skill of never giving up. Do you think that that, you know, it almost it's almost like a change in mindset. It's a change in perspective of going, this is the hardest thing I have ever gone through, but because it's the hardest thing that I have ever gone through, if I just continue to go through it, that will actually develop 
a skill set that I will use for whatever challenge life throws at me for the rest of my life. Yeah, I think like when you're in it, you don't necessarily think about where it can take you. Yeah. Um, but it's for me, in all of those challenges I've had, giving up was not an option. Mm-hmm. I did not allow myself to have the option to out. No compromises. No compromises. Mm-hmm. It is, sorry, you tell me no, I'm, whatever. It it's doesn't change anything for me. Um, obviously, you know, there are points when I was one of the lucky ones with the IVF. There are points that, you know, people will unfortunately have to stop the process if it's physically just not going to happen for them. And, you know, that's why we're so thankful for, for what we've got. Um, there'll be times when you do have to surrender in whatever circumstances you're given. But um, I think if there is something that is attainable and if you've got challenges or you've got sabotaging happening, there's a difference between self-sabotaging and allowing yourself to be a, you know, is it you just being weak in that moment or, um, you know, is, is there a real chance of you obtaining that? Then you've got to push through. That's incredible. That's really, really incredible advice. And I love the, the contrast between the self-sabotage and the, you know, just the never giving up. I want to almost change direction a little bit because one of the things that um, I, when I first heard that you were um, naturally introverted, I was very surprised. <laughs> <laughs> Most people are. Most people and the are. reason why I was very surprised is because when you're on stage, you like your stage presence is world class uh you. you know you you just you just light up a stage and Thank everybody you. is looking at emma when she's on stage <laughs> and i was like emma's an introvert like what the hell that doesn't even right? make any sense <laughs> uh, how do you like how do you do that how do you go from being introverted naturally introverted to somebody who is able to effectively perform the way that you perform and like there obviously there's a there's you're confronting your natural introvert to be able to do that how do you do that um i think for me i just embody who i want to be on stage uh visualization is huge for me and i teach all of my girls about it and it sounds a little bit hoo-ha to some of them um but it's a game changer visualization um so imagining yourself on stage and who you want to be on there and who what you want to show and bring um it's it's acting in some ways, but on saying that, I truly love the stage. Um, back to when I was a kid and wanted to be an actress, I became certain roles to play um, and I felt safe and I felt it wasn't me up there. It was who I was performing as. Yeah. Um, when I compete in bodybuilding, I still feel like it is me up there because I truly love the sport. I truly love but I love posing. I love all of the every aspect to it. And then it's just me amplified. Um, but, yeah, in uh, you know, in – one on one, I'm I'm great, and uh, you wouldn't catch me at a party, <laughs> you know. I'd rather be at home with my kids. Um, so yeah, it's it's a funny one, and I I sometimes don't even understand it myself, you know. Um, I'm the kind of person that won't go to a, a pool and wear a bikini. Yet I'll stand on stage in front of hundreds of thousands, well, thousands of people on, you know, um, on pro lineups mm-hmm. in a packed stadium, and not even shake and be completely confident. So. You mentioned visual, visualization, yes. um, and you mentioned that some people think it's a little bit fluffy and a little bit hoo ha and all these sorts of things. Um, I'm a huge visualizer. I visualize in all aspects of my life. In in business, I do it all the time. In in as a competitive athlete myself, I do it all the time. Even in my personal life, um, I'm big on visualization. I think it's uh, well, it's not even my opinion. It is one of the fundamentals of quantum physics. Mm-hmm. How do you actually visualize? If someone's listening and they're like, yeah, okay, like I've heard of this visualization thing and I know like Emma's talking about it when she's on stage, she kind of, you know, visualize, but like practically, how do you actually do it? Well, if we're talking about competing, um, what I tell my girls, I say, uh, you know, if you're at home at night and you're in bed, go through the moves, but don't just go through them. Imagine yourself on stage. Imagine the heat of the lights on your body. Imagine the sticky tan that's on there and it's feeling kind of gross. Um, imagine the heaviness of the bikini that you've got on. Um, you know, the hair, the makeup, every every element. Imagine looking out to the audience, seeing the judges looking straight at you. Um, with my girls, I always bring them up to stage and let them have a little peek before they come on. So it kind of cements that and re- removes that fear for them as well. But yeah, the visualization, um, actually seeing yourself doing the thing and in 
complete detail. So um, I only started visualizing in the last probably three years. Um, prior to that, I would always shake on stage. Um, and generally I would do an easy class first, say, I'm not, uh, say first timers or whatever it might be, just to get the nerves out yeah. because I would shake. I couldn't stop shaking. Um, and then I started visualizing and now I'm like so solid on stage, not one shake. I just feel completely calm. The detail is a super important part of it. You know, whenever I talk to people about visualizing, it's not, you know, um, like in, in uh, business, for example, it's not about like visualizing, you know, one of the things I used to do, right, back, back when I started MJ's and I was literally running the business out of my bedroom in my parents' house, I visualized the building we're in now, right? But I didn't just visualize like a building that I'd like work from. I visualized what it would feel like to like open the door, right? I visualized what it would smell like. I visualized what it would feel like to walk on the carpet. Like all of the little like detail, the, the really minuscule details, I think is such an important part of visualization because it really, it ties the physical to the emotional, and I think that that's some, something that a lot of people overlook when it comes to visualization. And this is why I say it's a fundamental of quantum physics because it's really important whenever you're trying to visualize a future self or a future circumstance or, you know, whatever, whatever you're trying to bring into reality to attach the emotion as if it's already happened, yeah. right? So, you know, when it comes to competing, for example, you you feel the the bright lights, you hear the crowd, you feel what it feels like to stand on the stage and all those different bits and pieces. But how does it make you feel, right? Emotionally, right? When you're shaking, what is that? Is that anxious excitement? Is it like, what what is the emotion attached to it? And I think if you can really start getting not just the, the attention to detail around the physical aspects, but the attention to detail around the emotional aspects as well, that's almost kind of like, what unlocks because your body doesn't know the difference right your body cannot tell whether you're present whether you're future whether you're past a lot of people visualize their past and attach their emotions to things that have happened in past you know previous uh, chapters of their life and what happens well the future looks a lot like the past looked right because they're visualizing in the wrong direction and i think you know a really important part of that visualization process is attaching the emotion to a particular future version of yourself. Yeah, Would you agree? A hundred percent. It's all that manifestation, isn't it? Yeah. Um, manifesting your future and seeing it and feeling it and then you believe it. And then once you believe it, well, look out because you're going to go get it. hundred percent. Yeah. Talk to me a little bit about this transition from the safe government job, as you described it, as a police officer, <laughs> um, into the very unsafe, very risky uh, building your own business from the ground up. Yeah, I'd like to say it was well structured out and thought about, but it really wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> this is a heart-led business it and is. it's uh, it's kind of stayed that way. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I I did a lot of spiritual work on myself throughout all of this period, all of all this time, uh, basically after I left SAPO. Um, and it came down to the fact that my passion was there. And if I walked away from that, uh, it would have killed me inside. Um SAPO was ne uh, being a police officer was never me in any way. Um, I I couldn't go back for well, I couldn't be I couldn't have a boss. I'm my my own boss now, which is great. The freedom that this gives me for my children and my life is amazing, which is a huge aspect for me. Um, freedom is a core value for me, um, and being in SAPO was the complete opposite of that. Um, so there was that. Um, and it was also almost a little bit of, um, I felt obliged to people that have followed my journey, my clients, that what I preach, I need to follow through with it. And if I had gone back to being a police officer, it didn't align at all. It didn't align with anything I believed in, agreed with, um, you know, the freedom factor and, um, yeah, so in the end it was, it was a bloody hard decision because the safety net, even having those, you know, five years of doing what I'm doing and loving now, but having that as a backup was always there. I'm like, oh, even if I fuck up, you know, it's okay. I've got, yeah. I've got safe all there still. They'll pay the bills. <laughs> um, yeah. So it was a huge step to finally take that contract and sign, sign it away. Mm -hmm. Um, but I haven't looked back since. And when I had made that decision, it kind of made me try harder with my business and my clients. It kind of, you know, made me give more 
Well, you, I, you're all in at that point, yeah. right? Like you, it's the old burn it has your boats. It, it, well, you've got no choice, no. right? It's the old burn your boats, right? Like you, if you want to take the island, burn your boats and take the island. Really hard question because it's one thing to kind of say, yeah, you know, it was a really difficult decision at the time and, you know, the safety net was there. and But your life situation at that point in time, like you're a mother of three children, right? Like running your own business, especially starting your own business, like you didn't buy like a client base or, you know, like it's literally grassroots. Absolutely. Ground up. Yep. Incredibly <laughs> risky. There's absolutely no guarantee of success. How did you make that decision? Uh, I just, but I just trusted in the universe. Yeah. <laughs> Again, sounds fluffy, but I figure if you've got passion behind something, um, it, it'll work mm -hmm. as fluffy as it sounds. Um, and I knew that there was an avenue there to build. I, I was doing everything myself and still am. Um, I think, yeah, I just, um, I don't know, I've just lost my train of thought. <laughs> it takes, it takes, uh, I think I know what the answer is. Um, so let me see if I can help you get to it because it's one thing to say, trust the universe, right? And, and we've spoken about visualization and quantum physics and, and so on and so forth. But in the, in the, in the, um, the, the process of making that decision, when you're in the moment of making that decision, it takes a lot of courage. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, it's courage is what it comes down to. Let's put ourselves in the listeners and the viewers position uh, where they are at this crossroad in their life and they have something that they are super passionate about that there is absolutely no guarantee that it's going to work. But there is like the trust in the universe thing and there's the pull to go and do that. But at the same time, there's the safety net. There's the boats, right, that they can jump back on and go back to the life that was. What piece of advice can you give that will help them summon the courage to take the step? Oh, I think this is, this is a hard one because it took me… I told me, you it would be a hard question. It is because it yeah. took me five years to come to my conclusion. Uh, otherwise I would have walked away the day I walked out without having the, the career break. Mm -hmm. It took me five years and I worked with a, a lifestyle coach to help me get there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it was one of the hardest decisions I've had to make. So I think it's all individual. Um, but is, in a business point of view, there's got to be room for growth in whatever you're wanting to do. You've got to have something, um, you know, you've got to be able to have a, you know, you've got to make money. So that's the logistics side of it. So you can't just kind of pick anything and go with it. Like you've got to be realistic. Like I had, like you said, I've got three kids that do a lot of sports and it's very costly, yeah. um, you know, <laughs> I've got to survive. And um, so, you know, for me it was um, I knew that there was an opportunity there to grow. So I think that was a huge one for me. Um, and the other one of just alignment. You know, if uh, if what you're doing now is hurting your soul, it's not aligning and you're slowly leading a slow, painful death because, you know, um, that's the way I saw it. I thought if I put a uniform on again, like, like kill me now. Like, you know, I see the way I looked at it was I used to see black and white and now I, as soon as I left the police, I just see rainbows. Um, and how can you walk away from that? Which I couldn't. So I think, you know, passion if it's your true passion and there's room for growth, yeah. then trust yourself and go for it. Yeah. And I think there's a little nuance here as well, right? Because there's a difference between courage and blind courage, yeah. right? And one of the things that, uh, you know, I, I deal with, a lot of people come to me with this sort of scenario where it's like, I found my passion and this is what I want to do and I want to make a living out of it. And I'm going to be the entrepreneur slash businessman, businesswoman, and I'm going to turn my back on my career that I've invested five, 10, 20 years into and whatever. And my advice is always like, well, just, okay, pump the brakes for a second look at where you're at in your life, understand all of the different responsibilities that you have. Is there like, is there the possibility to do both for a little bit? Right. And just test the, like, you don't have to go and you know, I'm big on closing the door behind you, but you don't have to go and slam the door behind you the first chance you get, right. You can just explore a little bit and kind of go, okay, I'm very passionate about this. Can I actually turn it into a business? 
does being a lot of people think that like entrepreneurship is this fluffy magical fucking unlock to happiness it's really fucking hard it's hard work right <laughs> running your own business is really fucking hard and you can be passionate as shit about what you're doing but you may just not have what it takes to run a business and you're not going to know that until you experiment a little bit right so it, there's a little nuance there where yeah it takes a lot of courage to make that decision but don't have blind courage, right? Absolutely, yeah. Like it's perfect just, explanation. If, you, if yep. you've got the opportunity to experiment a little bit, see if it's exactly what you think it is. See if there, and you mentioned, right, see if there is the opportunity for growth. Then you'll get to the point where you can build up that courage to make that yeah. decision. And as you mentioned, it took you five years. It took me five years. And even to the point where, the you know, the fifth year mark, I got the phone call and I had a, a job lined up, ready to go back in. Yeah. And uh, it was a lot, and I was just like, oh my God, all right, I'm going to resign. And I just signed the paperwork and it was the best feeling ever, yeah. but scary as shit at, at the same time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it took me up until that fifth year mark to trust in myself to be able to do this. Yeah. I mentioned that business is very difficult and um, entrepreneurship is very difficult, much more difficult than anybody who doesn't run their own business thinks it will be. Um, you are incredible in the fact that you are able to, I don't want to use the word balance because I think balance is a huge cop out. Let's go with manage, right? Yeah. You're incredible in the fact that you are able to run your own business and deal with all of the challenges that come along with that. You're a mother of three children. You're a wife. You compete. You not only just compete, you are the best bikini athlete in the state one of the best in the country, one of the best in the world, right? <laughs> <laughs> Blushing now. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> no, but it's true, right? It. <laughs> yeah, but it's true and you've earned it, right? You've mm, earned all of you. this. You've earned everything. How do you manage all of these moving pieces? Um, I think, yeah, like you said, it's definitely not balance. It's management. Yeah. Um, and you ebb and flow throughout it as you go. You prioritise what's important at the time. For me, of course, Family is all, is the most important factor. So boundaries in my business is super important. When I was building this business, there was times when I was just trying to get clients and my name out there with posing and I would be posing from morning to night. Um, and so my kids would be having dinner at home without me. And here I am doing $50 lessons, you know, like it was crazy. And for me, mum guilt, avoiding mum guilt is my number one priority in life. Um there is nothing like mum guilt. So I will do everything I can to avoid that. Um, and putting boundaries into my work is one of those things. So uh, I only work, you know, nine to three <laughs> when the kids are at school. They're not going to miss me. Same as when I train. I train early in the morning when they're all asleep. So I don't interfere with life. I don't interfere with them. Nothing changes when I comp prep. It's always the same. Um, I'm home for dinner now at night time. Um, and then, you know, the business, it, it runs in the time and people, if they can't do nights, they make it fit. They always do. Um, because that's just the way that I run my business. Um, and the people still came. I was scared of setting those boundaries to begin with, but I still have clients. They, they understand. And I think that the change for me was obtaining soulmate clients. And, um, that's a big one for me. I don't want anyone. I want someone that I gel with and that we can, you know, we're, we're a good fit. And if we're a good fit, they have their own boundaries and I have my boundaries and we just gel and things work and we get the result. Um, you know, I don't want to be resentful for my passion and my job. And um, I think, you know, having said that, downtime is rare. I'm not going to lie. It's definitely not all, you know, it's not all bloody roses, that's for sure. Um, I don't watch TV, you know, there's no sitting down on the couch. There's a lot of work, especially with the fact that it's all online for a lot of my coaching side of things. Um so, you know, there is no downtime and I guess my downtime is doing the sport runs for my kids, mm -hmm. you know, but I don't see it as a, a bad thing. I love it. I truly love doing that. Um, but, you know, when there's people that say that they, they can't compete because they've got kids, well, of course you can. It's just a matter of prioritising things. Like I said, if this is your lifestyle with, compete, with bodybuilding, then competing is just nothing really changes other than food. Like you still train, you still eat well. Um, it's just a matter of prioritizing. And I think, 
that's kind of how I manage it is um, putting my priorities in place and it will ebb and flow. Obviously when I compete, it's it's full on when I compete and there are things that have to fall away a little bit. You know, socially I might not be able to go out, you know, with my mates and have the pizza and, and that kind of thing. Um, I might be so exhausted. I know like I've got very patient friends, like they, they know when I'm on comp prep, they'll ask me out. I'm like, I just can't, I don't have the energy. And they're completely okay with that. And then you go into repair mode post-comp. Um, yeah, so I guess that's how I manage it. Inspirational. Guys, seriously, go back, rewind for like the last five minutes and listen to the last five minutes again. It's it's incredible. Like it's one of the things I, w- I was um, preparing for this podcast and I was speaking to my wife, Amy, about you. And uh, I was like, I want to ask Emma this and that. And I said, the, the main thing I want to ask Emma is how she manages everything that she's got going on. Uh, because it's inspirational to me, right? And I've got a lot going on, but I don't have children, right? And I kind of go like, you know, Amy and I were planning to have a family and, and I kind of go, oh, shit, okay. I'm going to throw that in the mix as well, you know, with everything else that I've got going on. And sometimes I even fall into the um, – it's a limiting belief effectively where like, how am I going to do all of this? And I think that's what for a lot of people, a lot of females in particular, a lot of guys also is it's like, I can't be a top athlete and also be a mother or a father, or I can't be a really good mother or father and also run a really successful business. Or I can't run a really successful business and then also be a top athlete, right? There's almost like these mutually exclusive circles where it's like you have to pick one thing and for whatever reason, you can't be really good at all these different things at the same time. Yeah, You are proof that it's bullshit. Well, it's just, all of that's just excuses in my eyes. I mean, um, I hear a lot of that and um, it's just excuses not to achieve a goal. Um, there's always a way. You can always find a way and find time in the day. Um, yeah, you might be tired, but, you know, go to sleep earlier. Turn off the Netflix series. Um, put things in place so that you achieve that goal if you really want it. Um, and, you know, I, I can't stand it when I hear that um, there's a belief out there that you have to be selfish to be in this sport or that um, that the children must suffer or the family must suffer when you're competing. It doesn't have to be that way and it's certainly not that way. I, I don't believe it's that way at all. Well, you're proof um, that it doesn't have to be that yeah. way. Like look at you. Look at everything <laughs> that you do. Like it's – honestly, it's inspirational to me, Emma. Oh, I'm, and I'm not saying that because we're on camera and we're recording this podcast. Like it actually is. Like I've thought about you – in times when I've felt like I've got a lot going on and it's all a little bit too much and how the fuck do I make all, how do I manage all of this? And then I think about Emma and I go, oh, fuck, Emma's doing all of this and then that and then more of this. Well, if she can do it, I can do it. So you actually inspire me. Wow, I'm, I'm not even saying, you know. Compliment. Thank you. <laughs> it, but it's true. Yeah. I'm going to ask you a little personal question for, for, for um, something that I've been wondering. Do you have an analogy that you use that helps you from a mindset perspective manage all of these different things that you have going on at a particular point in time? Or is it just for you, it's just prioritize, execute, put boundaries in place, prioritize, execute? A little. Yeah, I'm very structured with it, I guess. Very methodical. Yeah, Yeah. I think so. It's a a process. It's Mm -hmm. a bit like comp prep. It's just you get it done. Mm -hmm. I don't really think too much further into it. Um, you know, people say to me on my, when I'm in comp prep, I can't believe you're working still. Yeah. Or I'm like, are you kidding? This is like just what I do. It's kind of like brushing my teeth. You just do the thing. Mm-hmm. And then comp, then peak week's here all of a sudden. So it kind of keeps me distracted, I guess, in some ways. Yeah. Um, just, yeah, like you you just make it part of your lifestyle. Like this is my, very, very um, methodical. Yeah, methodical, yeah. yeah. It's just, it, it, it really is incredible how like there's just, there's almost like no limiting belief there. You're just like, fuck it. I'm going to do it all. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you <laughs> know, it's almost like you kind of have to. You have it's, to live one, you only once, right? Yeah, so. yeah. But it's it's almost like that dark energy coming through again, right? It's like, well, if people say it can't be done, I'm going to show people that it can be done. Definitely. It's just, that's that masculine energy that I use. Um, that's definitely where my, my business, my comp preps, all of that kind of stuff just gets it done and – um. Yeah, you know, I that's how I roll. <laughs> mm-hmm. You mentioned uh, mum guilt. And this is a question that I'm going to ask on behalf of all of the mums listening. 
who are also in, into fitness or compete themselves, there is on the male side of things, and guys, we don't get this, but I'm just kind of trying to build a little bit of a picture here. On the guy side of things, like if you're a father and a husband and you, you know, you got some muscle and you go to the gym and you look good, it's like celebrated. It's, you know, it's like the, you know, the, the anti-dad bod type thing, you know, it's like, yeah, he's the man, like fantastic. When you're a female, it almost has the potential to go the other way. It's like, oh, well, how come you look like that? And how come you're able to uh, prioritize your fitness? Oh, you must be selfish. You can't be a good mum. You're giving up time that you should be spending with your children. And it almost flips to, to effectively mum guilt. Have you experienced that? Um, I have. I think more so for me, uh, whether I just turn a blind eye, I think a lot of my clients suffer that or if it's their own beliefs that are just kind of there still that they're trying to release. Um, yeah, you know, there's there is certainly some people I think that aren't in the fitness industry don't get it and they don't understand it. And But it's one of those things that they've um, – whether it was like a bit of jealousy that's still there um, – there's definitely that, but I think it's about in, in, you know surrounding yourself with the right kind of people um, that realize it's not about that at all. And I think for me as well, if, if I'm happy, if I'm training and I'm strong and I'm healthy, I'm actually doing that for my family as well. Um, I'm going to be a better mom. I'm going to be happier, a hell of a lot happier if I'm mentally stronger. Um, if I, you know, if I allow, because it is a busy life of running the kids around everywhere and doing all the things, if I'm not happy in myself, then that would be, you know, a nightmare. So, um, yeah, I think there is definitely that element there. And I think mums have um, just, you know, the way that society is built, that there is extra pressures on on mums versus dads. Um, you know, the dad's the breadwinner, the dad does that, you know, and the mum's meant to, it's still the same, even though it's, you know, everyone works these days, but it's yeah. still that old mentality, isn't it? That's kind of there still. We're in 2023 and it sometimes it feels like we're in 1950. Oh, yeah, it's yeah. really, it's a shame, but I think um, it's just trying to, you know, the more people like me that can come out and show you that you can allows other another person to be as courageous and, and try for themselves. And then it's just a, um, it's a domino effect. If you can show it, then they will do it, then someone else will do it, and then her friend will do it. And then you realise that you can do it in a way where it's not going to affect everyone, that you can live relatively balanced. Um, and, yeah, that's kind of how I, I go with it. Well, it almost kind of comes back to, you know, what we were speaking about regarding managing everything, right? It's like, well, you can't be a great mother and then also be a top athlete and then also be a top athlete and run a successful business and then run a successful business and be a great mother. It's, it's all bullshit. Like, you know, the, everything compounds on top of each other to actually make you better at everything at the same time. It's not, they're not mutually exclusive. It's not like one pulls from the other. They compound on each other and they, every area of your life can, can increase like you're blowing up a balloon at the same time. It's just your limiting beliefs that may prevent you from doing that. And who knows where they come from, whether it's societal pressure, whether it's your childhood, whether it's your close circle of friends who are feeding you this bullshit like it's just not true and you know once again like you're living proof that it's not true last thing i want to ask you about long-term fitness mindset and longevity in fitness and you have a really unique journey and i think you're going to provide a really unique insight into this in the fact that you uh came into the competing side of fitness quite late in life. I think your first show, you were like 33 or 34. Uh, and you, I guess kind of your introduction to fitness was coming out of an eating disorder, using fitness as a way to get healthy. And you've always kind of kept long-term health in mind as part of your fitness journey. For a lot of younger athletes, both male and female, I see this in, in, in both genders, it's almost the opposite. It's I'm going to use fitness as a short, I'm, I'm going to look at fitness from a short term perspective, especially in competing. I'm going to push my body as hard as possible. I'm going to do things to my body that I know are going to have negative long term effects and long term consequences. And I don't really care because I'm only in this for the short term. 
that is the prevailing mindset, especially in the competitive community, especially with younger athletes. You are the complete opposite of that, right? So I'm interested to understand how you think about fitness and how you think about competing and how it ties into your long-term view of overall health and fitness. I always say like that if I was to have competed earlier on, it would have killed me. It would have been so wrong for me. So I always say, you know, you've got to compete for the right reasons and you've got to have done the internal work. You've got to have done it because if you don't, you'll, you'll be destroyed by it. Um, you know, it can't be about trying to look good for the X. It can't be for stage photos for this once off. Um, you know, it can't, you know, everyone has their own reasons, but it's got to be done for you for positive reasons. Um, you know, and for me, yeah, it was a complete opposite. So I'm thankful as, yeah, as much as I would love, love a few more years on me. Um, you know, I, I'm thankful for my journey and I'm thankful for the internal work that I did to get to the point that I am now where I can compete quite well balanced. And, um, I think, yeah, long term, you know, um, I can't compete forever. No one can. You know, why would you want to anyway? Um, you've got to give up the competing side of things. But, um, you know, the good thing about bodybuilding is you can be a bodybuilder and not stand on a stage. So you can always continue that. And, you know, as we know, as we as we age, that the more muscle you have, the, the better, you you know, the stronger your bones are going to be. So it does become about longevity and movement and being there for your children and your family um, in the healthiest you that you can be. Um, and just remembering how good it feels to train. So just remove the com- remove the idea of competing altogether and we do this because we actually love training. It feels good to lift. It feels good to be strong. It's empowering. It's very empowering. Um, so I'll be holding on to those feels once competing days are over. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Do you have any, and I, I think this, this might be a difficult question for you to answer just because your journey has been effectively flipped on its head, but do you have any advice that you can offer to the younger female and male athletes coming through that don't have that same sort of mindset where they're, they're very much like, I'm just going to destroy my body for five or 10 years and, and just go hell for leather and then I'll deal with the consequences later and I don't really yeah. care. Yeah. I think, you know, we were talking about it earlier about the pendulum effect. Yes. You know, about if, you, if you're going to, you know, at the end of the day, bodybuilding is, is, is this an extreme sport. Yeah. Is extreme. Everything about it is extreme. Um, the level of body fat you've got, got to get down, the things that you do, you're overtraining, you know, you're undereating. Essentially, it's controlled diet, you know, starvation to some degree. You've got to do it the right way and it won't be. Um, but there's a lot of mis, uh, misadvice out there that's just wrong and a lot of people are destroying their bodies for a plastic trophy, a $5 trophy. Um, and you've got to think long term, um, you know, health is everything and without health, you've got nothing. You really don't. And I think especially for the the young women in the industry, um, who want to have children, I mean, yeah, it, it's, uh, hormonally, it can take some time to repair. If you've come down quite low in body fat, it can take the same amount of time of dieting. It can take that same amount of time to, you know, come back from that if you're lucky. So, you know, so hormonally in itself, um, you've got to just be very careful with competing. So you throw in uh, anything that you might, you know, that your coach might tell you to take or whatever it might be, then you're, you're dealing with something on the extreme end of that again. Um, so there's going to be throwback from that and it can be quite devastating for some people. Um, so you've just got to, you have to think long term. Yeah, I yeah. really like the pendulum analogy. Um, our bodies are much better at keeping us alive than <laughs> we think that they are. And if you push your body to an extreme in one direction, just like a pendulum, it is going to push back in the other direction just as hard. Yes. So there are consequences for what you do in the short term and um, you're going to have to deal with them one way or the other. You know, whether you're male, whether you're female and you, you're, you're young and you haven't thought about having a family, but it is something that you want to do at some point in time, understand that what you're doing to your body now you know, you, you're going to have to fix that. Definitely. I think um, bodybuilders and themselves, we're, we're generally kind of the same. You know, like we are, have that addictive personality where we yeah. go hard yeah. and it's, uh, it's all about the one percenters, mm-hmm. all about the one percenters. There's always something more that you can give a little, you know, push that boundary just a little more to get the extra edge over someone else. Or, um, you know, there's always something extra you can do. And, um, yeah, the fallout from that can, is the reality is, is it's there and eventually you're going to have to look at it. If you don't, you know, for getting your bloods done, for instance, if you're not getting your bloods done, um, you just, you know, it'll come back and bite you. Your body will be the thing that tells you in the end. 
Uh, I think I heard a, a quote the other day that says if your body, um, your body whispers before it screams. Yes, very so, true. Yep, so mm. you've got to listen to your body. Um, and in competing, when you do compete, you shut that off. <laughs> you have to because you t- your body's telling you to eat and rest and you say, no, I've got a comp date to get to, you know. So you kind of shut that off. But eventually, you know, when you do finish competing, you um, you have to listen to the body before it gets to the point of screaming at you. Emma, you're incredible. Thank you. Thank you so very much for um, giving up your time to to come on the show and um, uh, some of the insights that you've offered in the last hour and a little bit have been honestly some of the best insights that have ever been offered uh, in the history of the Fitness Times Business Podcast. There is just so much goodness in this conversation uh, and it's incredible you've never done a podcast before. <laughs> I can tell one on one we're good. Yeah. yeah you can no. tell me how many people listen to this. <laughs> yeah I'll tell you when we uh, when shut we, right when, down. Yeah, when we, when we uh, lock down this episode but thank you so much I really appreciate your no, time. Thank you for time. having me. Um, where can the listeners and the viewers find you? They can whether, find where, me. And whether they're interested in just following you personally because they're like, wow, Emma is incredible and inspirational or whether they're interested in um, learning posing from you or uh, coaching or any of the different things that you offer, where's the best place to find yeah, you? Yeah, I mean, my, my personal page where it's all about me is on my just uh, under on Instagram, Emma Bowman. Yep. Um, IFBB Pro yep. um, and I have a coaching page attached to that as well so just check my bio and all my coaching stuff's on there for posing um, my comp clients my lifestyle clients and also starting out the hyperpressives which is the stomach vacuum uh, information so there's a lot of information coming through um, very soon yeah awesome guys if you have enjoyed uh, listening to this episode if you've taken value from this episode if you've been inspired by Emma's story and the different pieces of advice that she's given uh, over the last hour or so uh, the one thing that we ask in return is that you guys share the show you can share it person to person Uh, one of the best ways to share it and help us spread the word is to take a screenshot right now on whatever podcasting platform you're listening to whether it's iTunes or Spotify or SoundCloud or whatever post it in your Instagram story tag Emma at Emma Bowman IFBB Pro tag myself at Joseph Mensel uh, and we see those tags and we'll share as many of them as we uh, possibly can but we appreciate you guys spreading the word Emma thank you once again Um, it's been an absolute pleasure guys you could have been anywhere in the world right now but you're here with us we appreciate that until next time we'll catch you on the flip side thank you guys so much for tuning in to this episode we hope you enjoyed listening a couple of things to round out firstly if you've yet to subscribe to the Fitness Times Business Podcast on your favorite podcasting platform, make sure you do that right now so you don't miss any future episodes. Secondly, if you guys took some value from this episode, the one thing we ask in return is that you share the show. And finally, if you've yet to leave us a five-star rating, make sure you do that before the next episode.